Let us pray. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who your faithless disciple Judas sold for a vile sum of money to the Jews who were persecuting you and conspiring against your life. Root out, I beg you, from my heart, all evil love of any creature. Grant that I may never prefer anything to you. May I always show the most perfect charity towards all men, especially those who trouble me. Pardon me, my holy Redeemer, for having so often preferred vain and perishable things to you, and for having, for the sake of vile pleasures, turned myself from you. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who ate the Passover with your disciples at Jerusalem, according to the commandment of the law, giving them an example of humility and holy love by kneeling down on the ground and washing their feet, wiping them with a linen cloth. I pray that this your example may penetrate my soul, destroying thoroughly any haughtiness and pride within me. Give me, O Lord, the deepest humility, that I may, without delay, perform the lowest ministry to all men. Give me perfect obedience, that I may, with complete diligence, observe as your commandments whatever your appointed representatives may decide. Give me the most fervent charity, that I may sincerely love all mankind. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who out of your unspeakable love gave us the sacrament of the Eucharist and in it given yourself to us with wondrous liberality so that you might remain with us even bodily unto the end of the world. Grant me, I beg you, O Lord, an earnest longing and enkindle in my innermost soul an intense hunger for this adorable sacrament. Grant that when I go to the table of life I may receive you with chaste affection, complete humility and perfect purity of heart. May my soul so thirst for you now and so languish in your love that I may one day be found suitable to enjoy the delights of your eternal kingdom to the glory everlasting of your name. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when you were about to leave the world, commanded and comforted with words of unspeakable sweetness your disciples, and most earnestly, com earnestly commended them in prayer to your Father, most plainly showing how tenderly you loved them and us, who were to believe through their word. Grant that my heart may evermore relish your word, and that I may find your words sweeter than honey to my taste. Oh, that the spirit of that burning exhortation may so glide into my heart that I may be wholly transformed into your love. So direct all my ways, O Lord my God, that your holy will may be done in and by me for ever and ever. Praise and honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who went out with your disciples across the Kedron brook and came into the garden which you knew would be where you would be taken. May I entirely give up my will and always follow and love yours. May I, for your honour and for the salvation of my brothers and sisters, boldly endure any adversity and be willing even to lay down my life if your divine providence should so ordain it. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, as your passion drew nigh, began to be sorrowful and sad, with a heavy heart, and so that by transferring the weakness of all your members to yourself, you might be able to console and strengthen them when they were in their time of fear at the approach of death, by this your own weakness which you had willingly taken upon you. Preserve me, I beg you, both from the immoderate sorrow and from foolish gladness. Grant that the grief which I have thus far endured may be for your glory and for the remission of my sins. Remove mercifully from me all distrust and unnecessary weakness and confirm and establish my soul whole in you. 
Praise and honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who fell prostrate on the ground and prayed to your Holy Father, humbly offering your whole self to him, saying, Your will be done. Give me grace in every necessity and trouble to fly to you in prayer and freely to resign and myself give myself up to your will. May I never unduly endeavour to escape from trouble, but receive all things from your hand with a quiet mind, and may I endure everything in meekness of spirit for your love. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall sing your praise.
A reading from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 12, verses 1 to 21. At that time, Jesus went through the grain field on the Sabbath. His disciples, being hungry, began to pick heads of wheat and eat them. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is against the law to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? How he entered the house of God and ate the sacred bread, which was against the law for him and his companions to eat, and only being for the priests. Have you not read in the law that the priests in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and are yet not guilty? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what this means, I want mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Then Jesus left that place and entered the synagogue. A man was there who had a withered hand. They asked to Jesus, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? In order that they might accuse him. He said to them, Would not any one of you, if he had just one sheep that had fallen into a pit on the Sabbath, take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good the Sabbath. He said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and it was restored, being as healthy as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted against him, as to how they might assassinate him. When Jesus learnt of this, he went away from there. Great crowds followed him, and he healed all of them. But he sternly warned them not to make him known thereby fulfilling what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love, in whom I take great delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will neither quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. He will not break a bruised reed or extinguish a smouldering wick unless he brings justice to victory. And in his name the Gentiles will hope. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The first part of today's reading covers the concept of Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath. It is necessary sometimes to do work on the Sabbath. But let us consider the accusation that the Pharisees laid against Jesus and his disciples. For the disciples were hungry, and they gathered the ears of the corn. This was allowed by the law. But it was the Sabbath, and there were Pharisees in attendance, some of them rulers of the neighbouring synagogue, some perhaps spies sent from Jerusalem to watch what Jesus was doing. After the healing of the impotent man at the pool of Bethesda, the leading Pharisees in Jerusalem had resolved to take an opportunity of arranging the death of Jesus, and from that time their emissaries appear to have dogged his very steps wherever he went. They were watching everywhere, in the cornfields and in the synagogues, in the streets and in the meadows, in Galilee and in Persea. Now they accused the disciples. It was a prof profanation of the Sabbath, they said, to gather the ears and rub them in the hands, being equivalent to reaping and threshing, and that was forbidden on pain of death. But consider the Lord's answer. For the Pharisees insisted on their tradition, but he referred them back to the Scriptures. 
The Pharisees condemned the disciples, but David, their great saint and hero, had eaten the showbread when he and his men were hungry. The disciples had broken the law only by implication. David had done so directly. The sufficient excuse in both cases was the same, namely hunger. The law of God is merciful. It does not forbid a work of necessity on the Sabbath day. Again, every day the priests changed the showbread, including the Sabbath, and offered double sacrifices on the Sabbath, and yet they were blameless. The strict observance of the Sabbath was set aside for the sake of temple service. But there was one greater than the temple, one who was himself, in the highest sense of the word, the true temple of God. For in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. His disciples, hungry whilst attending to their Lord, were as guiltless as the priests engaged in their temple duty. The error of the Pharisees was a common error of formalists and hypocrites. They cared more for the letter of the law than for the spirit, more for the outward ordinance than for the spiritual principle being embodied in the ordinance. The Lord referred them again to that deep saying of the prophet Hosea, which he had already quoted in Matthew chapter 9 when they blamed him for eating with publicans and sinners. At that time he bade them go and learn its spiritual meaning. Clearly they had not done so, being as ignorant as ever, well read in the letter of the scriptures, but ignorant of its great and holy truths, which are often bidden from the wise and prudent, but by the grace of God revealed to children. They transposed the divine order of things. They put the letter above the spirit, outward form above inner worship of the heart, sacrifice above mercy. They came to Christ, but it wasn't to follow him, but to vex and persecute him, to falsely interpret his words, to find opportunity to kill him, not to learn the holy lessons which he teaches to his true disciples. Guilty themselves, they condemn the guiltless. Mercy is better than sacrifice. Sacrifice is good, but mercy is infinitely better. It is good to observe the outward ordinances of religion. They are precious aids ordained by God, but they cease to be of any good at all if we forget that they are only there to help us. If we trust in them while we break the higher law of charity. To condemn the guiltless is a grievous sin. To speak evil of our neighbours, especially of those who follow Christ in sincerity, even though they may differ from us in many things, is a crime in the sight of God. To come to God's house with uncharitable intentions, to spy, to find fault, to misrepresent, is the sin of the Pharisees, for which the Lord rebuked them sternly. The Son of Man, he said, is Lord even of the Sabbath day. The Pharisees exalted the Sabbath in a way which destroyed its true meaning. The Sabbath was made for man for his spiritual necessities and for rest from worldly labour that he might devote himself to worship and to the care of his soul. The salvation of man was of infinitely greater importance than the outward observance of the Sabbath. That was the great end. The Sabbath was one of the appointed means. It was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The Son of Man, the representative of humanity, the Son of God, who had become the Son of Man for man's peace and salvation, was, indeed, truly Lord of the Sabbath. He might sweep aside the traditions of the Pharisees and their rigorous formality for the sake of suffering humanity. 
He is Lord over the ordinances of the Sabbath day. Those ordinances belonged to the ceremonial law, being a shadow of things to come. Colossians chapter 2 A preparatory discipline In this, Christ has shown himself to be Lord of the Sabbath for the sake of his church, for the new humanity in him, that he has changed the day from the end of the old world week, which passed away forever with the still Sabbath of his grave, to the beginning to which an entirely new state of things commenced, and so has made the day peculiarly his own, the Lord's day, and has united to the remembrance of the first creation, whose Sabbath was broken and rendered servile by sin, the praise of the new creation effected by him who became a son of man for the sake of man. Let us examine in more detail these works of mercy. We read that another Sabbath had come, Luke 6, 6, and the Lord, as he was accustomed, attended the synagogue worship. It was their synagogue, those very men who had been dogging his steps and who had so lately accused his disciples, were its rulers and elders. The Lord was not like some man nowadays who absent themselves from church because they have, or fancy they have, a quarrel with the minister. The church is the house of God and we go there to worship God. No earthly motive should be allowed to keep us from it or to influence our thoughts when we are there. In the congregation on that day was a man with a withered hand. It hung useless by his side. Maliciously, the Pharisees pointed him out to Christ, not in sympathy for the poor man, but in their hatred and spite of the Lord. Their hearts were overflowing with malice. In the very house of God, on the Sabbath which they affected to vindicate, they sought to ensnare to his destruction one who had done nothing but good. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? They asked him. Seeking not instruction, but an opportunity of accusing their holy Saviour. Blinded by their malice, they did not understand that no profanation of the Sabbath is worse in the sight of God than an evil thought, a malicious design. No crime could be darker than to try and cause the death of the one most holy, most merciful, and amongst sacred association, on the day which the Lord had set aside for his worship. The Lord answered, as he so often did, with one question following this. Surely they would not hesitate to save a sheep from danger on the Sabbath day. And if a sheep, how much more a man? He lifted the question at once into a higher sphere. He was not going to argue it on the basis of some formalism. He will not dispute, as it seems the Jews did afterwards, whether or not the sheep might be lifted from the pit, or only helped to get out by means of planks. He went at once to the principle. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Not to do good when it lies in our power, is to do evil, as we read in Mark chapter 3. Therefore, is it not only lawful, but it is our bounden duty to do works of mercy on the Sabbath day. St. Mark, in his account of the events, tells us that our Lord was grieved by the hardness of their hearts. He looked around at them with anger. It was anger against the sin and grief for the state of their hearts. He would have saved those scribes and Pharisees. He would have won, won their hearts, but they were too stiffened into hardness by their miserable formalism. 
they would not come to him, that they might have life. And Jesus was sorely grieved. In the same way he is grieved when we sin. Grieved for us. Grieved for our folly. Grieved for our danger. He looks around at them with anger. He does so today when men cherish evil thoughts in the house of God. For he is present. He reads their hearts. Their secrets cannot be kept from him. Or oh, what a scene there would be if the hearts of a congregation were to be opened to the eyes of men as they are open to the searching eye of Christ. Even so, there was a work of mercy needing to be done. Turning to the man, he said, Stretch out your hand. And so he stretched it out. He believed the word of the Lord. He willed to stretch out his withered hand. The muscles, though previously helpless, obeyed the wish of the will, and his hand was restored whole, being like the other. So if we, in trusting faith, will to come after Christ, he will give us the strength to stretch forth our hands, to take up the burden of self-denial, and to follow him. The strength is his. He gives it. He asks us only for faith. Only believe, he says, for all things are possible to him that truly believes. See the effect upon the, the Pharisees. They were consumed with rage, St. Luke tells us in chapter 6. The Greek word meaning wicked folly rather than insanity, madness. And they took counsel against Jesus. How might they destroy him? He had made them look foolish. He had put them to silence and yet he had done nothing which could be made grounds of an accusation against him. There is no wrath fiercer than that of frustrated malice. The Lord's anger was righteous, mingled with an overwhelming grief. Theirs was wholly impious, satanic, for the hatred of goodness is the very character of the devil. They were blinded by this angry and wicked stupidity, to such a degree that they joined with the Herodians, the party to which they were most fundamentally opposed. To plot the death of Christ. Worldly and wicked men hate any manifestation of goodness, for it is a reproach to them. The contrast makes their character appear all the darker, and they will combine against it, laying aside a time their jealousies and enmities will effect its downfall. But our Lord reigns. And then we come to the patience displayed by Christ and his retirement into another country. And why did he do this? Let us say straight away that it was not a result of fear. Jesus was not afraid of the Pharisees, but his time had not yet come. He left, it has been said, not only because of his enemies, but for them. He would not want to bring upon them the guilt of his death. He would give them more time, yet another year, perhaps. He would try what could be done by patience and gentleness, and self-denying love. He did not wish to stimulate their malice further by remaining in their neighbourhood. When men are heated in dispute and controversy, it is often best to retire. Persistence may just stir up the wrath all the more, and perhaps increase the sin of those 
who are arguing on the wrong side, influenced by party spirit, or, perhaps, by the evil of their motive. The Lord could not be alone. The Pharisees hated him, but great multitudes followed him still. Some sought his teaching, others his mercy. He listened, as ever he did, to their cries of pain and sorrow, healing all that had need of healing. For the opposition of his enemies did not dishearten him. It did not turn him aside from his work of love. Good men are often very much cast down by the strength of their opposition. They lose heart, sinking into a state of melancholy as Elijah did toward the end of his ministry. They think that their life has been wasted, that they have no more work that they can usefully achieve. But it was not, the say, not so with the Lord Jesus Christ. He retired, but it was to another field of labour. His servants, you and I, must never give way to despondency. It implies a distrust, a doubt of our Lord. He charged the multitude, though, that they should not make him known. He was content that his holy deeds of divine love should remain unknown. He was willing to work on in obscurity, for he did not seek the praise of men. He sought only to save souls. And so his servants should also be willing to work either in private or in public, in remote corners or before the eyes of men, wherever it may please God to set him. But wherever, as in the little village or the great city, they must seek only his glory and not human praise or earthly reputation. Isaiah had prophesied the Messiah, and now the same God who had inspired the prophet was bringing to pass the prophecy. Christ came to fulfil the law and the prophets. The details of his blessed life were so ordered as to bring about that great end, to fulfil all that had been written of him. The prophecy came from God. The fulfilment also was regulated by his overruling providence. Isaiah, the evangelical prophet, had faithfully portrayed the character of Christ. He was to be the servant of Jehovah. I came, he said, not to do my will, but the will of the one who sent me. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. He was the servant of whom Isaiah had prophesied. He was the beloved, the elect of God, for it pleased the Father by him to reconcile all things to himself. At his baptism, the voice from heaven proclaimed that in him the Father was well pleased. He was then anointed with the Holy Spirit and consecrated for his divine mission. He would proclaim judgment to the Gentiles when he would send his apostles into the world to preach the gospel to every creature far and wide. Such was the prophet's description of the servant of Jehovah, and such was Jesus the Christ. He shall not strive, the prophet said, and it was even now fulfilled. He had withdrawn from strife. He loved not strife. His disciples must learn of him. They must avoid, as far as lies within them, angry disputes and the heated atmosphere of controversy. He shall not cry. His teaching was not noisy, nor was it violent, but it was calm, quiet and dignified. He delighted not in uproar and excitement. He did not in today's way of speaking, stand on street corners with megaphone. But he delighted in quiet communion with God. His disciples differ from one another. They present different aspects of the Christian character. The Holy Spirit divides to every man separately as he will. 
but we may say that a holy calmness is generally a characteristic of the most advanced followers of Christ. A bruised reed shall not be broken. There were many bruised reeds then amongst those who sought his help. There were many such amongst his disciples today. Weak, trembling Christians with little strength, bowed down with sorrow, suffering, bruised by many a trial and many a temptation, and, it may be, by many weeks and concessions to the tempter. He will not break them. They are fearful, trembling, full of anxious doubts. He is gentle exceedingly, and so his, ser his servants should be. The smoking flax he will not quench. He will not despise the least spark of spiritual light. For the flax may burn dimly, very dimly indeed, but if it burns at all, there is a hope. If there is any tenderness of conscience, any sense of sin, any yearning after God, however feeble or intermittent, there is the possibility of conversion, of sanctification, even of sainthood. He will not quench the smoking flax. Indeed, he will fan it into a bright, clear flame. He will not, through harshness or sternness, check the faintest hope after holiness, but deepen, strengthen, and guide by the influence of his Holy Spirit. For it was to save our souls that he came down from heaven and gave himself to die, that every human soul is precious exceedingly in the sight of God. He will not lightly lose that which he prized so highly. He will cherish the slightest flickering of the flame of life in the weak or dying soul. So do not quench the spirit. Do not quench it in yourself by sin or despondency. Do not quench it in others by harshness or contempt. But listen to that soft, tender whisper of the blessed Spirit of God. Listen like Samuel, and it will fill your whole being with its pervading influence. But if, like Saul, you persist in disobedience, the end at last must be like the end of Saul. The Spirit of the Lord departed even from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. This quiet gentleness of Christ will result in victory. He will persevere, winning souls one by one, by the soft, holy and tender influence of his ever-constraining love. He shall not fail, shall not be discouraged until he has set judgments in the earth. Isaiah 42 He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall at length be recognized as king and judge. His judicial decision between right and wrong, his rule of holiness, shall at the very end prevail. It will be the victory of truth and righteousness, and that not only in the Holy Land amongst the chosen people, but in his name shall all the Gentiles hope. The isles shall wait for his law. They shall wait and not wait in vain, for he is the saviour of all men, a light to lighten the Gentiles. He will send out his holy law, the divine law of love, to draw all men to himself by the attractive power of the cross. Such is the picture drawn by Isaiah of the Christ, a picture in which we too can see the strength of gentleness and the imperial majesty of love. These are the weapons by which the Saviour overcomes the world, and his disciples must learn of him in quietness and in confidence, shall be your strength. Gentleness and Christian love win more hearts than sternness and severity. So let us conclude. Remember that the letter kills, but that the Spirit gives life. 
never exalt the letter above the spirit. Fear to truly profane God's holy day by thinking unholy thoughts and words, for he sees into the deepest parts of your heart. Believe in his word, stretch forth the hand of faith, and he will give you strength. Study the prophecies of the Old Testament, for they give us precious views of our Messiah's character and teaching. Christ was the servant of Jehovah. We are his servants. We should strive to do his will as he ever did to do the will of his Father. Imitate his quietness shun violence and noise, cherish a holy quiet in our soul, and be gentle like the Lord, kind to the weak and fearful, nurturing, for great is the strength of tenderness. Let us pray. O God, whose never failing providence orders all things, both in heaven and on earth, we humbly beseech you to put away from us all hurtful things, and to give us those things which are profitable for us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.